space below the surface of planet Zebus. Samus Aran faced the space pirates. She destroyed their operation, wiped out the parasites called Metroids, and defeated Mother Brain. But the pirates were far from finished. Welcome to Smash Pieces, a casual walk through the history of the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate roster. My name is Joe. And my name is Matt. And if you're new here, what we are doing on this show is we are playing one game for every character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate from 1984's Duck Hunt to 2019's Fire Emblem Three Houses. And today's game is representing fighter number four, Samus. It is the 2002 GameCube title, Metroid Prime. And of course, if you were listening to the Mario Sunshine episode, then you know that we're not alone for this one. Please welcome our friend George, aka Super DQP. Hi, welcome. I've already forgotten the um, the monologue from the beginning from last episode, so I'm, I won't repeat it. I'm sorry. Hello. I it, it'll have played at the beginning of this episode. That's my plan. Ah, that'll <laughs> Don't work. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, editor. You're the greatest. Woo. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm the editor. Peter's the editor. I just put the music in. Well, yeah, uh, that's that, that 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 that's why I did not say thanks, Joe. That's why I said thanks, editor. Eh, that's fair. Anyways, so this is a first-person shooter. In fact, this sort of. And the sequel, it's straight up a first-person shooter. What do you mean, sort of? It's a first-person adventure, Joe. Get it right. This is the kind of thing where it's like, it is literally a game in first person with shooting, but if you think about, if if we're talking about first person shooters as a genre with genre conventions, you're someone that likes Call of Duty and Battlefield, you're not, they're not gonna, you can't just put them in front of Metroid Prime and expect them to get into it. Yeah, but that's not what defines a genre. It kind of is. Genres are dumb. I mean, they are, yes, but, like, you could, I don't know. I I consider it a first-person shooter with the addendum that it is a, a Metroidvania, and one of the first major console first-person shooters, the only one really on the GameCube, honestly, uh, this would have been, if I remember correctly, around the same time as Halo? Very close. And both of those games are kind of considered to be like... Both of those games, I believe, Halo more so, obviously, are kind of considered to be like, yeah, these are the games that showed people how to make an FPS on a controller. Metroid Prime less so? Yeah! Because Metroid Prime's GameCube controls were... Not real. Did not really become standard. Well, that's just because the GameCube controller is bad. Um, yeah, jo- Joe, I you I know you've you've never played the GameCube version of Metroid yeah, Prime. Yeah, I've not. But um, it did not in any way <laughs> set the standard <laughs> for first person shooters on controller. I uh, have heard so many people talk about that game as if it is one of like the best examples of putting together a first-person shooter within the constraints of that specific controller. Really? So I I would say that modern first-person shooter design, the the biggest thing that it has in common with Metroid Prime is that you use the analog stick to move. Yeah. Nothing else is similar at all. Even then, debatably, in the GameCube version of Metroid Prime, that was tank controls. So you not only used the analog stick to move, you used it to look around, too. Oh, yeah, like you didn't, that. you didn't use the triggers to shoot. You changed your weapons with the, with the other analog stick. Yep. Like, which, granted, is better than uh, how the Wii version does it, which is the version that me and Matt played, which is really clunky. Switching between visors and and beams. To be fair, um, I have 100%ed the GameCube version before. And the controls may sound bad. And they are, by modern first-person shooter standards. <laughs> but for the purposes of Metroid Prime, it's perfectly workable. Like, it, it's, it's still very playable. Because nothing really involves much precise or fast aiming in Metroid Prime. Yeah, I mean, it's got the lock on, too. 
Yeah, I would actually compare it more to like a 3D Zelda game on GameCube. If only because like it basically has Z targeting, you know, I, it it really does. And this is a big part of why I say like this isn't a first person shooter. It's a first person game with shooting the way that you do the shooting isn't even similar to other first-person shooter games. It has more in common with The Legend of Zelda. You lock on, you press a big face button to to use your weapon, and you don't have to aim. You don't, like, you never have to consider anything about ammo except for you'll eventually run out of missiles. It's, don't it, have to aim sounds very modern FPS, thank you. Oh, pshaw. <laughs> How? Aim assist. Well, somebody's playing shooters on consoles. <laughs> Get a load of this guy. Yeah, you know what game doesn't have aim assist? Metroid Prime. Did you lock, lock on? How is the lock on not considered an aim assist? Lock on and aim assist are different things. You're a different thing. True. They serve the same purpose. They literally don't. Aim assist is literally the controller is not good enough to aim precisely, so we nudge it a little bit. It doesn't lock on. Look, I don't play a lot of shooters, all right? What do you want from me? I'm aware. It's very clear. (laughs) But yeah, the GameCube version's all right. (laughs) It's pretty good. So, like, this is legitimately the first I've ever heard of somebody tell me that the controls in Metroid Prime are bad. I didn't say, I don't, I don't think they're bad. I just I, think they have The no, word bad has no, been used multiple times in this conversation. Not, Joe, not Joe, by me. Joe, you are the one who brought Metroid Prime has bad controls into the conversation, I think. Yeah, I said the Wii version has bad controls for moving, for switching beams and stuff. The Wii version! Didn't you also bring up earlier in the conversation, it's like, oh, I've heard the GameCube version is not great for controls. No! No? Did I misinterpret that? Okay. I have I said that I've heard that it was lauded for the way it used the GameCube controller oh, well. Oh, my bad. My, my bad then. Sorry. Because <laughs> that's literally all I've ever heard about this game. I, I no, you said. I think you think you said that. You no, said I that did it was say a, that! You said it you said it was how first person. It, it was an example of first person shooter control on controllers, which it's not. It does, all right. The controls are fine, but they have nothing in common with other first person shooters. Again, I didn't play the GameCube version. How am I supposed to know that? I'm going by what I've heard over the years. And if I, I trust you guys when you tell me that that is incorrect. So how are the Wii controls anyway? I mean, they're fine as long as you're not having to switch anything. <laughs> I I was perfectly fine playing it with the pointer controls. Uh, turning on the lock on, I can't believe it's turned off by default. But mm-hmm. it kind of sucks that the like we had this generation of pointer controls that were really cool and really worked well. And then that's just gone forever. <laughs> like gyro just doesn't work as well. We're never getting this back. Yeah. Gyro still works fine, but not, not nearly, nearly as well as, as the well. Wii Mote. Not, not nearly as well, and also not nearly as many games support it. Yeah. The fact, uh, the fact of the matter in terms of that is, like, everything about playing the game on the Wii is fine. It's when you have to hit minus or plus and then physically move the cursor down to where you want it to go and sometimes it'll give you a certain i don't know a boss that switches between what kind of beam it can be hurt by uh near the end of its final phase very quickly and it's just it feels so clunky to switch the visors i think were the worst one i could sort of do the beams but like Switching between the visors. First of all, can I just say, I don't like any of the visors. Aw. I don't like them at all. You had a lot more trouble with the switching than I did. Than I ever have, I would say. I, 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 I kind of wasn't expecting you to have so much trouble. I don't know, it just it felt slow. And also really, really made me not like that. Unlike a regular Metroid game... Uh, like Super Metroid, the one we've played before this point, the beams are all separate instead of like in Super Metroid where they're all kind of, they just stack on top of each other. And 
then once you've got that beam, now you can open that beam's doors. And also, in Super Metroid, as far as I remember, the doors turn into regular-ass beam doors after you've opened them the first time. I don't remember, because you kind of don't have to remember. Because yeah. you, just, you just keep the yeah. beams. <laughs> But on, but in this game, you'll hit hallways where it's like, all right, the entrance is an ice beam, an ice beam door, and then the next one's a wave beam door, and then it's another ice beam door on the other side of that, and it it got really annoying, and I think that's when I started to get fed up with the beam switching. Uh, overall, like I think having enemies that can only be hurt by certain beams are fine. Like, uh, I think it's a little. A little weird that the space pirates eventually start having types that are like, oh, this one's purple and they're shooting a wave beam and that means they can be hurt by the wave beam and only the wave beam. I think narratively that's stupid, but like, I, I, I'm fine with that concept. It's just the method of switching the beams is clunky and... I just, I could not get the hang of it very well. In fairness to the rest of the Metroid series, they kind of stopped doing this after Prime 2. Like, Prime 3 goes back to the to the beam stacking thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Prime 2, that's its own. <laughs> that's its own thing. Um, and, you know, Prime Hunters, I think, is the worst offender, because that's like, that game's got fucking ten of them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> But it didn't work out so bad for me, partially because, you know, in this playthrough, I played on a GameCube controller. And so using the C-Stick and the D-Pad wasn't bad. I mean, using the GameCube D-Pad in any scenario is bad. Well, yeah, but... the placement of that thing is a, an act of malice. <laughs> yeah, I w- and I, I would say that the, the, the pointer controls for how you swap the beams and the visors they did the they did the best they could frankly because yeah well yeah i don't know what else they would have done there the wiimote only has so many buttons on it even when you attach the nunchuck to it yeah because and and like prime trilogy exists because people played prime three which knew it didn't have those buttons and so put it put beam stacking back in so that you didn't have to deal with this problem. But people liked that game so much that they were like, well, let's go back and do the others. And then they had to solve this problem of, oh no, there's something incompatible here. I can't remember. Did Prime 3 have the same visor switching method with the minus button and gesturing in a direction? Uh, if I'm being honest, I don't even remember if Prime 3 had other visors. <laughs> it did. It, it, ha- it, had the, it, ha- it had the scan visor, because all of them do. And I've it never also replayed had the, Prime 3. Uh, and it also had like the um I don't want to turn this into a Prime 3 podcast, but it did have different visors. I, I mean, so. we're never going to have a Prime 3 podcast, so we literally you, you never have know. The we literally have plans to eventually bonus episode Prime 3. They don't know that. That's a <laughs> secret. <laughs> We've literally explicitly talked about that to each other and now they do know. So now we have to do it. <laughs> Uh, but I do want to go back and, and reiterate that I don't like the other visors. I don't either, I think. Uh, the scan visor is fine. The scan visor is perfectly fine. Uh, I think it's a neat way to get sort of lore. I think scanning enemies is a neat way to get like, oh, that's how they expect me to kill this thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The thermal visor, all right, fine, whatever. It, I don't I don't really care, but whatever. The X-ray visor is terrible. It's a it's a bad visor. I don't like the X-ray visor at all. So the scan visor is legit one of my favorite additions to like the entire Metroid series. One of my favorite things in the whole Metroid series, just because I love the way that it helps to flesh out everything in the world. I would I would say the scan visor is like the the biggest thing that this game does really well and what kind of ties it all together. Yeah. I think if you didn't have the scan visor, this just wouldn't be as good of a game. I agree. I, I think it works really well with the whole theming of Metroid, which is that Samus is, you know, walking through these places alone, sort of after stuff has happened or As things are happening, which is, I really liked how eventually you get into a bunch of pirate logs of like, yeah, so Samus is here, and uh, (laughs) we, uh, this, look, (laughs) 
This ain't good, and we gotta do something about it right now. <laughs> that only gets better as time goes on. <laughs> like, well, shit, we gotta, we gotta change our passwords. Oh, God. <laughs> like, I think it's in Prime 3, where it's one of them is just, like, describing the premise of the game, and then it just says, truly, we are cursed. <laughs> <laughs> Science team has advised that we stop this. Yeah, this that's the best one. The, the, the absolute best one is them talking about recreating Samus's <laughs> suit abilities and talking about the morph ball and <laughs> like, yeah, we've uh, people have died. We should. <laughs> scientists have told us we should stop. We're gonna. We're gonna stop. Even, like, the less consequential scans, like, the ones that don't get added to your logbook, but they're still explaining what the room you're standing in is and everything, yeah. that, that makes it so that there is a story being told every step of this adventure, even though it's literally just you by yourself walking through planets. And it sets that atmosphere immediately when you get to the the friggin' Orpheon at the beginning of the game, and you're just reading these logs of, like, the damage that's going on, escape pods have been jettisoned, power's been lost in multiple sectors of the ship, and it's just slowly revealing what's going on, and you, you get the... You start to get the idea that they, they were experimenting on these parasites, and the experiments went a little too well, and now they're <laughs> fucked. Yeah, like, um, I think, like, a lot of people at the time... And also today, this is something that the game is praised for today. Um, a lot of people talk about this game's atmosphere and how it is very absorbing and very immersive. And I think for Metroid Prime, as hollow as it might sound at first, I think that's kind of the entire point. Because that's something that the scan visor is really good at doing, is it's getting you to care about the world. And that's ultimately kind of what's at stake in the game's narrative, is that, you know... It's a game about uh, the industry of conquest and war kind of clashing against the natural ecosystem of Talon 4. And the game does a really good job of getting you invested in that ecosystem because you learn everything about it. It's, I think it's really well done, and it had a really big impact on me when I was, when I was younger and I first played this game. Well, I do have to say, in regards to the game's relationship to its planet, uh, they did it wrong. Talon 4 is still there when Samus leaves at the end of the game, and that's not how that's supposed to work. Okay, Joe, whatever. <laughs> Don't worry, Joe. This 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 game is unique in that you do not destroy a planet. Every single other Metroid game I've touched has ended with Samus fleeing a planet as it fucking explodes and everything on it dies. <laughs> She didn't destroy a planet in Metroid 2, but don't worry, she went back to it later. <laughs> <laughs> went back to finish the job. <laughs> which, which, same about Metroid 1, actually. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> that's her home. Those are the two that I haven't played. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I, and, and it's funny. I, I'm not going to give you too much context because spoilers, but the answer to does Samus destroy a planet in Prime 2 is... Maybe? <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> that feels like something that shouldn't be able to be vague, but all right. <laughs> Did the sun go supernova or not? I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> eh. I feel like we'd know. <laughs> okay. So I did want to take this back a little bit because we went on. I went on this big tirade about how great the scan visor is. The thermal visor. <laughs> the thermal visor is... I like the idea. Um, I think the thermal visor is fine in the area in which you get it and then stops being fine immediately upon exiting that area. I do love the story that, you know, Retro Studios always likes to tell about how they introduce the visors to this game, which is the story of how, like, Miyamoto apparently dropped by switching and was heads, like baby what, what what if what if samus could put on a bug's head and it just took them a while to just parse what the hell that meant well it was because miyamoto doesn't fucking speak english right uh, and, and he you was know, at, it, he was talking about like different types of helmet and visor right but he, he worded he, it as what if samus could put on different heads no it's not like he was just there trying to speak English. He had an interpreter. He said what he meant. 
Well, and, he, and you know that didn't because Samus doesn't take her hat off and put a new one on. <laughs> Hot take. Um, I love the way the X-ray visor looks. Like it's not very it's not very practical, but I love how it looks. It's also just not very functional because like it, it like it just puts a fog over the world where you can't see two feet in front of you. Like the X-ray the X-ray visor looks cool because X-ray stuff looks cool. The problem is I need to be able to see when I'm playing your first person platformer. Yeah. And if I can't see, then fuck you. <laughs> and also, how do you convey to the player through your world design that they need x-ray vision to progress? That they need x-ray vision to see platforms, which is not how x-rays work. How do you show the player invisible platforms? How do you show them that which cannot be seen? By making it rain. Oh, I think I, I have a suggestion. I have a suggestion. Don't put invisible platforms. I mean, no, they actually do a good job with that. You can f- visibly see the rain landing on nothing. Oh, well, not in all the areas, such as the worst area of the game. Like, I literally did. And I was like, oh, I can get up this way. And I mm. didn't have the x-ray visor. So there's no rain in the phase on mines. Uh, by the way, the phase on mines suck they're a blight on this otherwise pretty good game we'll get to it we'll get to it (laughs) holy shit they're so fucking bad but uh that i think that is cool in places where there is rain but the biggest places where i had issues with the fucking x-ray visor were areas that did not have rain there was i was cleaning up for a hundred percent um during my last playthrough and there was there's a missile expansion in Magmore Caverns. I think it's in the Triclops Pit. The room's called the Triclops Pit. And uh, there's no way to know how to get that missile expansion unless you just happen to be walking through there with the X-ray visor. And I, I mean, once you have the X-ray visor, you start to go, okay, this that nothing else is solving this puzzle. I guess the x-ray visor solves this puzzle. Yeah. It's... Which, yeah. that's kind of like how it is in the phase on mines for me. It's like, okay, I just got the x-ray visor. Maybe I'm supposed to use the x-ray visor. Yeah, and then I use the x-ray visor and then I can't fucking see anything but the invisible platform. Well, yeah, the x-ray visor's bad. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't think the context of it existing is bad. They, they, they got it. They got to do something to nerf it, so it's not just like the detective vision and the Arkham games where you just have it on all the time. Well, do you remember the X-ray visor in Prime Three? Yeah. Wait. Here, Joe. Let me share you a picture. Oh yeah, that right. <laughs> At least I can see the ground. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's the little thing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> with your with your Arkham City detective vision. You ever you ever fucking looked at an actual X-ray? You can't see anything but the bones. <laughs> That's why we use <laughs> X-rays. Man, it's crazy how some creatures can just biologically evolve to just exist on entirely different spectrums of light. That's crazy. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it sure is. If it's a good thing they didn't build an entire boss around that. Oops. Uh, but no, I think overall, I think this game is good. Other than the phase on mines, which uh, I would, uh, if I had the option to go back in time and convince Retro to jettison any part of their game, the phase on mines would be where it goes. I think that place is cool lore wise, but being in it is a poison, much like phase on. I would say Magmore Caverns because the game just literally get like gets yeah. better paced without Magmore Caverns. Yeah, they make you they make you travel through Magmore Caverns like like you get in between in between the time that you get the Varia suit and the time that you enter the phase on mines, you gotta go through Magmore Caverns like a minimum of six times, and that's if you know what you're doing. And that entire time, you're not getting any critical power ups in the caverns themselves. It's just you're not even getting any optional power ups. There's like four of them in Magmore Caverns total. Yeah, and so it's just it just kind of feels like you're going through Magmore just because you have to, and that's just kind of it's just kind of lame. Can I talk about the phase on mines yet? 
I did kind of want to add an addendum of like the X-ray visor, I think, is like the only real awkward power up of the bunch. Like, I like most of them. Uh, the beam upgrades uh, for the input that super missiles are on power beam. The equivalents for the other three beams, except for I think ice spread looks cool. I didn't get it. I watched Matt get it. I think that looks cool. Uh, but the flamethrower is one I did get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, flamethrower is useless. That thing flamethrower sucks. is actually useless. <laughs> I mentioned to uh, I mentioned to Grim I think in one of the Twitch chats that was like you know when you hundred percent this game and you get up to the final boss you can use the wave buster on it just like as a treat. Yeah, the, so the wave buster would be good if it didn't burn through your ammo in twenty seconds. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't cool, do though. enough damage to justify how much ammo it costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. F- phase on mines. Joe, go. They suck. They're bad. They're badly designed. They are the only... Like, so I had... I had difficulty reading the map for most of the game. I don't think that is entirely on the game in general, because, I mean, I don't know how the fuck else they do a map... Doing a Metroidvania in 3D, especially when you don't have anything to base it around. Uh, yeah, there is, th- like, the map is so much probably the best thing they could have done that, like, literally yeah. games today are still copying that exact map. Yeah, Jedi Fallen. Except. Except. The Phazon mines have multiple levels to them. And when you try to look at the fucking map in the phase on mines everything blends together and i can't tell what floor i'm looking at what floor i'm selecting all of the orange blends together into a blob of of fuck and i don't the phase on mines are so fucking bad and i'm gonna i'm gonna hold a grudge towards them for the rest of my life all five years of it I don't think they're that bad, like, the first time you go through it, because, like, even though the map looks absolutely heinous, um, it's actually kind of a straight line, more or less. Like, you just go from one end to the other, and then you just kind of loop back and leave. I mean, that kind of makes it worse, because then they could have just literally made it a straight line. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. It's not not like there's that many shortcuts to loop around and, like, make it less awful. Like, having the multiple levels on the map actively makes the map impossible to read most of the time. Um, And when you're making a Metroidvania, the map is kind of an important thing. And none of the other areas have this problem because all of the other areas are one level for the most part. (laughs) That are like two or three, but they're still like on the same. But n- yeah, none of them level. are on top yeah. of each other. That's the problem about the phase on mines is that they're all all these levels are on top of each other, and so yeah. when you try to like pan around and look around the map, it all just blends the fuck together. It's like those strategy guides that have like a map on the whole page, but then they can't fit the whole map on one page, so they have to put like the letter A next to one of the doors. To let oh, you know that, I was, like, the second I, page. I, I, just, I just saw that today for Aria of Sorrow. <laughs> yeah. To let you know that, like, the second page, hey, this is where A comes from. Another game with a bad map. Yeah, Fa- Phase on Minds is like that, except it's in-game now, and you have it's in 3D, so you have to move it around. I think my experience with Metroid Prime is tainted a little bit because I've replayed it so many times. So oftentimes I don't even really have to look at the map. I just know the layouts. Um, well, that's that's similar to how I was with Sonic Adventure 2. Like at a certain point, you're not playing the same game anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I can. So what it was fascinating watching Joe go through this game and stream this game as a first timer just to sort of relive, you know, what. What is this game actually like to play from a first-timer's perspective? Somebody somewhere in the world is going to get that exact experience for most of the games we play in 2022. Yeah. I haven't haven't played Wind Waker in a while, so that's probably going to be me once once I replay that. But, uh, it, like, I do think that 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 is a really interesting way to get a separate perspective of, like, 
That's why I really liked the the Ocarina of Time episode, because we had Matt, who knows the game inside and out because of randomizers. Oh, yeah, that one more so. Like, I'm not playing the same game anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Soul, who has played it a bunch, but is not, like, speed running. And me, who has played it once. (laughs) Yeah. Like, it was, it's just, it is very interesting to have those connections, because for the most part, like... If you know a game really well, like Matt said, you're not playing the same game as somebody playing for the first time. Right. Uh, when I play, like, Sly Cooper. Donkey Kong I'm not 64. Playing... When I play Donkey Kong 64, I I'm didn't not mean playing to, like, the same game anybody there, but... is. No, but you're right. That's the better example. Yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> uh, I, like, I know Donkey Kong 64, like, in and out and like the back of my hand and also i have a tolerance to its inane bullshit but somebody like matt playing it for generally the first time i know you'd played it before we did it but like we were playing different video games at that yeah and that's kind of that's kind of how it, it it can sometimes feel when it's like i'm the one that played it for the first time and everybody else are the people that played it multiple times at this point uh, that's not the, that's not like a negative or anything. That's, I think, a really, really interesting way to get different perspectives. Yeah, and I think that, you know, Metroid Prime in particular is perhaps not as much as Super Metroid is this way, but Metroid Prime is very fun to replay for me because you learn how to optimize your way around the map uh, when you're when you're getting power-ups. Like, we complained about Magmore Caverns earlier and about how you have to go through Magmore Caverns every single time you go to Fendrana or something like that. But there is like there are a few rooms in Magmore Caverns that are just specifically designed to be like junction points. So that, you know, if you're going from Fendrana to Phase on Mines, you can just go down one elevator, go a room over, and go down another elevator, and you're in Phase on Mines and stuff like that. So that that can be fun to um that can be fun to sort of find optimizations for. It, it doesn't change the fact that Magmore Caverns kind of needed a rework, but, you know. <laughs> so here's here's the thing about that is I didn't have a problem with Magmore Caverns. And I think that's really what it comes down to is I wasn't, like, optimizing my route to be the most efficient. I was just going. <laughs> yeah. And to be so, fair, you know, you as a first-time player, you know, we're complaining about how Magmore Caverns is just kind of a kind of a bouncer more more a bouncer than an area but you didn't realize that yeah, during well, you, this yeah, playthrough you probably had the assumption that like oh there's probably a better way to do this i just i'm just not good enough at the game and there really for magma caverns there really isn't a better way to do it no i i never had any thought like that before at all i think i i knew it was weird that going to fendrana was only possible through magmore but i never like, saw it as a buffering, like, sort of inconvenience. It was just sort of, that's where right. you go. And as a first-time player, you wouldn't really have had any reason to, because you would have entered this area and thought, oh, a new area, you know? Yeah, I I just can't help but look at it and see, like, oh, there's nothing that you actually do here. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's, I think that's really interesting uh, at the end of the day of those two I think that Magmore Caverns is a really interesting sort of definitive viewpoint of, like, that place has a different feel depending on when you have or haven't played the game before and how many times you've played the game. Uh, And I I do think that that's, that's really interesting, and I didn't actually think about it until literally while we were having this conversation. Hmm. Well, that's part of the reason we have this, these podcasts is so that we can, we can talk about it. Podcasts aren't real. True. It, you're you listening. Uh, we're not, none of us are real. We're a dream. We're a, we're a, we're a fucking simulation. You're uh, dreaming right now. Wake up, wake up. I I don't think I personally have anything else to say about it. I think the boss fights across the board are pretty good, except for Metroid Prime Core. Um, Metroid Prime Core 
just I don't think it's bad. I think it's bad. I just think it's I know I see what they wanted to do. Like regular Metroid Prime is oh man, you gotta get yeah, yeah, it's proving that you really know your way around switching to different beams and using the powers and functions of those beams. And then, you know, the core is supposed to be, oh, the visors, except as we've already covered, the visors suck. So and I'm also... Gonna, so, so I'm going to use the boss fights to kind of do a cool segue in a moment. But um, Metroid Prime Core, even if you know what you're doing and even if you're not struggling, it's just kind of a drag. It's just a boring fight. It's a wait around fight. Like you're literally yeah. just really sitting and fight. waiting for the boss to like let you play the video game. Yeah. And it's not, there's nothing interesting that you're trying to, like, avoid or do during it. It's literally just, like, you're you're spending time sitting and not playing the video game until it's time to play the video game. And the, the second phase, the second phase of Meta Ridley kind of has the same problem, but at least Meta Ridley is constantly attacking you. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was saying in Matt's Twitch chat during the Prime Core fight, like, at least Lingering Will had the courtesy to do really hard anime bullshit against you while in 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 between the moments you could hit him. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. that's kind of why I think that Meta Ridley is a better example of exactly what Prime Core does because you're sure you spend a lot of that phase not able to actually do damage to Ridley, but at least he's doing something on screen. Yeah. The problem isn't that you need to Sit, well, I guess this is kind of gonna kind of gonna be hypocritical because I said like the opposite about lingering will specifically, <laughs> <laughs> the, but uh, li lingering will pretended that he was vulnerable uh, because every yeah. other boss in that game was. But like the thing about Prime Core is that like it's like literally there is no gameplay during that. You're not you don't even need to really dodge stuff unless there happens to be fish in Metroids that you should really just not bother well, also, with. Also, he. He does the shockwave, which means you can hit A sometimes. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but also just the, uh, the act of his fucking... I under Like I said, I understand the idea that he goes invisible and you gotta use one of the visors to see him. One, if he is in the visible spectrum, then he should be visible in all the visors. Two, there is literally no indication about what visor you need, so you have to just, like, switch between the two, and as we've already covered, uh, X-ray and thermal are really hard to see anything while you're using, so you can easily just miss him. So, well, so, Joe, it, it's, it's funny that you, uh, that you bring up the whole, uh, you should be, when he's in the visible spectrum, you should be able to see him in every visor. Because we did just talk about how in the, in real x-rays, skeletons are all you can see. Yeah, but you, you can't <laughs> even see its skeleton. Who says this has a skeleton? I assume it has a skeleton. Who says it doesn't? It doesn't. The Who Metro Phase 1 is an exoskeleton. It can turn... Things with exoskeletons don't necessarily not have a skeleton. Please ignore all of nature, but... <laughs> <laughs> um. Prime Core also, like... I think Prime Core actually, like, consistently cycles between, like, visible spectrum, thermal, and x-ray just consistently as it goes. Also, I think the, the shittiest part about uh, Metro Prime Core in general, is it's really easy to accidentally step out of the phase on pool. Yeah. Which I did. I did a lot. And I genuinely, most of the time, don't know how. I just, it just happened. And I didn't realize it until too late because, like, I'm not looking down at my feet when I'm fucking shooting the boss. What? It's, it's dumb. Uh, that, that, phase of the boss fight is bad. The other phase I think is really good. I think the first phase of Metroid Prime is is great. That yeah, mm -hmm. phase 1 is an incredible fight. But the core oh, yeah. sucks. <laughs> I hate phase 2. And no escape sequence. No escape sequence. It just it acts like there is. There's an escape no. sequence. It just happens off screen. Yeah, that's stupid. <laughs> yeah. No, there's an escape sequence. It's just at the beginning of the game. 
Oh, that's true. It's a, it's okay. It's subverted it's a- expectations. It's okay. Prime two is coming. Yeah, Joe, you're gonna hate that. By the way, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, I did want to use the boss fights to segue into a topic that I kind of broached at the end of the Mario Sunshine episode, which is that um, I played this game in a weird way. We're about forty five minutes into this episode. <laughs> Nintendo stopped listening. Yeah, the lawyers aren't <laughs> listening. I can break kayfabe. <laughs> um, so I played this game in Dolphin VR, and I think that um, there's a lot of aspects of Metroid Prime that are really cool to see in VR, and another, a few others that are illuminating, if not in fun ways. Um, but one thing I wanted to bring up specifically for VR is that you don't really appreciate as much how fucking big the bosses are in this game. Like, like yeah, okay, you... you you're playing on the TV and it look and Meta Ridley looks pretty big. In VR, he towers over you. And it's like legit, really, really cool to kind of look up and there he is peering down at you, about to charge you, and you're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Or like, you know, we spent all that time dunking on Prime Core for not doing anything. But like, there's a few little moments in that fight where the Prime Core just kind of does a short little lunge at you, like boom. And, like, that shocked me every time it happened in VR. Because, like, he's lunging straight at you. And I'm just like, whoa, jeez. Um, it was it was really cool. Um, I couldn't play it for more than 15 minutes at a time. Cause... <laughs> I was about to say, this sounds cool. And also, like, the greatest motion sickness nightmare I could think of. <laughs> it sure is. Especially because I played it on a GameCube controller. Yeah, so that wouldn't I, help. <laughs> so I played a VR game with tank controls. And that did not feel great to play for longer than 25 minutes. After that amount of time, my brain felt like it was about to implode. Um, But... Also, um, you know, when you forget to use calling codes in Dolphin, you kind of get to see how the GameCube chooses to render what's in front of you. Oh, yeah, that's always fun. And that's and I, don't, I think it's a neat tidbit. You know, I, I'd prefer to have those codes on so like I can see the whole world. It t- teaches you a lot about how the game's programmed. Yes, um, it teaches you a lot about how this game was just kind of. And all games, let's let's be real, all games. It's a miracle that any video game is ever released, ever. Yeah, every single cool, incredible video game that's ever been important to you is put together with duct tape and spit and a wish. Like, do you remember, <laughs> do you remember when when Terry Cavanaugh released the source code for VVVVVV and everybody was like, holy shit! How does this game even run? <laughs> They're all like that. Every all video like that. game you have ever played is that. Yep. That's why that game had a 30 <laughs> FPS cap. Yep. Like, Me- Metroid Prime is my favorite game of all time. It is near and dear to me. It means a lot to me and has meant a lot to me forever. Oh my god, that game was thrown together in less than a year. And it kind of shows sometimes. That's video games, baby. Yeah. That's video games, baby. Yep. Yeah, wasn't the story of the like the behind the scenes uh, something like, yeah, it took us like six months to get like one level approved by Nintendo, and then we had a year to make the rest of the game. Yup. <laughs> yup. They made four prototypes, and they were all more or less scrapped. That sounds like Nintendo. Uh, it's a miracle more than anything it's a miracle this game exists it is this game had such a weird development that there's a what happened episode about it yeah this game (laughs) this game absolutely sucked to make um and it's still a masterpiece i still think it's fantastic um i do still think it holds up but oh my god it was it's a miracle this game exists it's a shame it's not a 2d metroid (laughs) So okay, I, I don't I don't got much more to talk about in terms of the game. Do we want to go ahead and switch on over to the music? The sure, music. Sure, the music's really fucking good. It, it is. really is. Bad. So I wanted to begin with a song that I got to experience at the beginning of the game, and you guys had to wait until the credits. 
Yeah. Says you, I experienced it 20 years ago. Fair, okay, <laughs> okay. I experienced it in Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Menu theme. Yeah, this is a really good song. I like the Brawl version a lot, which is the version that opened this episode. Yep. And I think the Brawl version actually adds, like, a riff, like, towards the end of it. I think so. Even though it's it's so similar in style that you you would have to know the menu theme by heart to know that it's an addition. Um, but I Who really says like, we don't? Th- I don't. True. true. I don't okay. either, really. <laughs> I I know it pretty well, but that was the first version I ever heard. <laughs> but I love that this song kind of establishes like the atmosphere and tone of the game that's to come. Uh, I think there's it does also really kind of like that, that electrical buzzing sound in it that works really well. Mm-hmm. Anyways, let's talk about the theme of Hot Place, Magmore Caverns. This song was really good in Super Metroid. I'm it's this is a really great OC remix of it. I bet it was much better in Samus Returns. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is uh obviously this is the lower Norfair theme. This is stupid. <laughs> like <laughs> remember everything that I said about this song in the Super Metroid episode about how it's thematically relevant to the the point in the game that it plays? The build no, up to Ridley. It's theme of hot place now, Matt. It's theme of hot place now. There's lava. That means we have to play this. <laughs> but actually, on that note, there there is one really good thing they do with this. Uh, on, I think on the OST, it's just called Magmore Caverns Burning Trail. And it's just, it's just this kind of prelude to the song that plays in the first room of Magmore Caverns. Right. And this is something that I really love when games do, where before, like, there is a, a foreshadowing of the, the song that's about to play. And it works really well. It, 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 it adds a little bit of tension and buildup. <laughs> On the YouTube, can I say what the first YouTube comment I'm looking at on YouTube under this song is? Go nuts. Quote, when I left the burning trail and this started up, three words resonated in my head. Welcome to North. (laughs) (laughs) But I do, I, I really do like that, like it establishes this sort of musical liminal space of sorts where it's like. It's like this sort of in-between between the Chozo ruins and the upcoming hot place, if you will. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like the in-between between old place and hot place. Old hot place. I think the Burning Trail theme is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and, and I mean, Lower Norfair was a really good song. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but... It's kind of it's kind of fucking wild to me that on the Samus Returns soundtrack it is called Magmore Caverns parentheses Samus <laughs> Returns version. <laughs> I um oh, no. I love that. so I remember oh, when no. I remember when Met, I remember when Metroid Dread was coming out and Matt and I were playing it. Um I I remember saying th- there's a essay from a YouTuber named Sideways about how Rise of Skywalker's soundtrack is just not great. <laughs> um, and the reasoning being that it just appropriates a lot of this different music that was very deliberately used throughout the Star Wars canon. 
but it just appropriates that music without really thinking about why. And as a result, it just kind of dilutes the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember playing through Metroid Dread, and I remember DMing Matt saying, like, this is happening to lower Brinstar as we speak, isn't it? Mm, a little bit. And and that's also been happening with uh, with the lower Norfair theme, unfortunately. At least in Metroid Dread, in that example, you are speaking to something that has something to do with Brinstar in general. That's true. It's it's better. It's which isn't much better than theme of Hot Place, but it's still better, I would say. In Samus Returns, and again, Prime 2, you'll get to it, um, it, do- it is basically just theme of Wet Place. Mm-hmm. But we, ha- like, we got theme of Hot Place, what about theme of Cold Place? Yeah, Fendrana Drifts. I love F- Fendrana Drifts so much. This is the best song in the game. I dearly love the general atmosphere and tone of uh, Fendrana Drifts so much. It's always just a place that entrances me every time I every time I play the game. And this song is a huge part of it. It's a very slow and sort of easygoing song. Um. I think it works really well. It's very beautiful. I'm gonna be real, I don't remember like any of the boss fight themes at all, except for versus Matter Ridley. actually might be my favorite version of the Ridley theme ever. It's up ever. there for me. It's pretty good. Uh, I really like both of the Smash remixes, but this just like this version is just really, really, really good. It pains and saddens me to say that the Other M version is also up there. <laughs> oh yeah, I like here's the thing, I think Other M's soundtrack is overall fine. Um, that's not one of the problems the game has. <laughs> There are many of them. The soundtrack's not one of them. But Mm -hmm. this version is just uh, something about, like, the energy of it and making it more electronic. Because, you know, he's a a cyborg dragon now. Because he's a cyborg dragon. We decided that would be cool. And we were right. Um, And just... I don't know, the general energy of this and the general energy of that fight. Despite the fact that I think that fight goes on a little too long... But overall, like, it's a really, really good fight, and this song is a big part of it, so much so that even though they had a regular version of this, like, a regular sort of rock remix in Brawl of this song, then they just straight up wholesale put this version in the game as well. Mm -hmm. They use it, they use it in future Prime games, too, and it's just as good. Yeah, it's the me- the Ridley theme has always been really good, and it just gets it kind of just gets better from here. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of of boss fight themes, uh, I would also say I think the Thardis theme is pretty good.
it's kind of got the right energy for the fact that you're like fighting a rock kaiju. Yeah, like there's just something very like strange and unhinged about that fight that this theme captures really well. Yeah, I mean you're literally fighting phazon possessed rocks. So yeah. I, I get that. Yeah, you're fighting the things from Breath of the Wild. I forget what they're called. Uh, they're from Galaxy Stone Talus. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, Stone Taluses. Um, also, another boss theme that I don't think is like quite that great, but it's notable because of a piece of trivia, which would be the Flagra theme. Because if you played this game on the NTSC release of the GameCube version, you you probably haven't heard more than the first 12 seconds of this song. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've only heard the first, like, third of it. Yeah, like, like legitimately playing through this time, I was like, oh, I don't know this song that well, because this is the second time I've ever heard it. And it does start, it's, it does start to ramp up near the end and get really cool. But you don't hear that in the GameCube version. And when you're playing the GameCube version of the fight, it's actually kind of funny. Because it just kind of meanders in that first 12 <laughs> seconds for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, so does Flagra. Because uh. <laughs> the, the idea of it, the thing that happened was that they, like, applied the loop for the song backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in instead of looping... Like instead of getting to the end of the song and looping back to near the start, it gets to near the start and loops to the start. Yep. I'm going to bring things back to Cold Place, and uh, I'm going to bring up Fendrana Drift's Depths, just because I can. Otherwise known as Fendrana Drift's Deep Lake Area. Which is, I think I like the more low-key version better, but this version is still, like... It's it's kind of insane how well it transitions into a higher pace, sort of... More... Slightly more action-y tone. This is the song I always start playing on my phone. Uh, whenever uh, we enter what we in Alaska call Fool's Spring. <laughs> which is where things start to melt... But it's not quite spring yet. So everything's just kind of wet and gross. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's yeah. the mood, yeah. That's the mood. <laughs> All right. So I hate to to drop the gavel here, but... Well, I got... There's a song that is kind of very famous that we got to mention real quick. Okay, I will... There's, you should do that then. Th there is the space pirate theme. Oh, Yeah. I was afraid you were going to say that. a lot i don't like i get the impression that you guys don't i think it's fine yeah. i think it's 
I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. Well, I, I've got a companion video for this episode, not not to go advertising on main. Um, but um, I'll put it this way. Uh, there's a segment where I talk about the Space Pirates, and I uh, I used Ridley's theme instead. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I will I will say that the, the future Prime versions of the song are kind of better. Yeah, I think... But this, this is like the composition that they use, and I think it's a great composition. I knock it as a song to listen to on its own. But I think for the Space Pirates, a force that is just cartoonishly Warhammer 40k levels of absolute masculine stupid. I think it works great. I don't know. It's fine. (laughs) I think it captures that level of just chaotic, mean we're gonna take over the world because we're angry kind kind of energy. I mean, I'll give it this. It's better than the Chozo Ghost theme. There you go. That's my that's my nice thing to say about this song. It's not terrible, but I have no attachment to it. Chozo ghosts, Chozo ghosts just suck in general. Oh yeah, they're yeah. just they're bad, and their song is bad. But you know, Th- those guys died, Joe. But anyways, we have got to start wrapping up. We have been going for as long as it might take to blow up a planet. No, I don't know what that means, and I refuse to elaborate. I mean, speedruns get pretty quick, so... Actually, yeah, yeah, you know what? You could probably have finished Super Metroid in the time that we uh, have recorded this episode. Metroid Prime, any percent. Uh, while Matt looks up uh, something that might sort of make my joke slightly funnier, but not... Hour and uh, six minutes. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, George, where can people find your stuff? Um, I am on YouTube at Super DQP. Um, I don't really do live streams, unlike, I think, most of the guests that you have here. But I do do... I think most of our guests don't, really. <laughs> yeah, I think DVD Smith might be the only one who does. <laughs> okay. Um, I do uh, post edited uh, essay-type content on there. I did actually, as I mentioned before, I did actually create like a companion video to this podcast episode and um maybe you can link that in the description i don't know if you're feeling that generous but um but you can find me on youtube at super dqp you can find me on twitter also at super dqp um i twitter is an addiction i've been trying to break so don't count on me being as active there as i probably once was but if you want to follow me that's where i am um trying to think of any other channels that i uh that i maintain but i can't really so there you go all right well i'm afraid our time here with metroid prime oh, has shit, we ended. got the question i forgot oh yeah that's true we have the question we have to ask i legitimately forgot about it until I, like I this last second here i 100 percent <laughs> forgot too i didn't forget thank god one of us remembered all right george what employee of nintendo do you want to physically fight i've been thinking about this for a distressingly long time okay but more I do than have i have an evidently <laughs> um the person at nintendo that i want to fight is the person in marketing who decided to show off boost ball before metroid prime federation force <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the worst marketing moves. At, like that, everything that I've heard is that like that game's fine. Like it's pretty good, but like, but Boost Ball, <sighs> it's like it's like legitimately someone's entire job to make sure exactly what happened with that game does not happen. 
So that so that's who I want to fight. Well, I'm afraid now we have to open the hatch on the well and uh well, it's going to take a minute to load. So you got to you got to wait. <laughs> oh. I I shot the hatch <laughs> and now we're waiting for it to open up and now goodbye. Ah. Uh... All right, with that taken care of, let's get into our next game. And that game is representing fighter number 43, Toon Link. It is the 2002 GameCube title, The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker. Is it really 43? Yeah. Toon Link is fighter number 43, apparently. Toon Link was in Brawl. Yeah. Numbers are weird. How many many did they cut? What the hell? A lot. (laughs) For, For Wii U, a good amount. No, for Brawl. Oh, for Brawl? Ugh. Did you get Toon Link in there? At 43, when there were only 35? Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. There were a good amount of newcomers in Brawl, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Wind Waker. I like this game. I like Wind Waker. So, people aren't going to like what I'm about to say. Well, uh, maybe you shouldn't say it, then. Let me, let me preface this. There wouldn't be a podcast if you did. Let me preface this real quick. I'm going to say every 3D Zelda is great. Like, every 3D Zelda is one of the best games that released the year it came out. None Mm -hmm. of them are bad. With that in mind, Wind Waker is by far the worst 3D Zelda. I disagree. It's my second favorite 3D Zelda. I don't like the dungeons in this game very much because they're very much straight line. I can see that, yeah. I think I think for sh- for sure, like Twilight Princess has this game beaten in dungeon design, like every step of the way. To be fair, I think I think that like it's it's like overwhelmingly easy. Like y- you take like nothing gives you more than a quarter heart of damage, and it takes a long time before they let you explore the sea. Like it like. You're stuck on a straight, invisible wall path through the sea for a while. See, I don't remember that, but I've, I've only played this game twice. Uh, once on GameCube and then once on Wii U, which I will be playing the Wii U version for this simply because it's just the, it's the one I have accessible to me at this moment. I probably will too because of the way that it fixes the Triforce quest, but yeah. also the Wii, the Wii U version kind of ruins the graphics. I think I agree with that. Like, I think I think the art style of, of Wind Waker as it released on GameCube was perfect. And they they went into it with the Wii U version and mucked it up. I don't I do not like the art style changes in the Wii U version. I don't think the Wii U version looks bad. I just think I agree the GameCube version looks better. It doesn't look bad, it's just so obviously a downgrade. Uh, but I, I really like Wind Waker simply because of the sailing. I, I just kind of enjoy the act of sailing in general, of getting around. And I completely understand why some people really don't like that. Um, like, I I understand 100%. But also just like, I think a lot of Wind Waker has this sort of personality that isn't present in a lot of the other games. Uh, I mean, it has some of the best NPCs in the entire series. Yeah, there, there is a good sense of, like, the aesthetic of the world and the the people in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's one of the... It's, like, one of the few games in the series where the story really resonates, I think. Yeah, uh, I think Ganondorf is done super well in the game, which we'll talk about when we actually do the episode, because that's the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I think the general plot, outside of one issue that we'll probably cover on the episode, uh, involving Tetra. Is it the Tetra thing? Yep. Uh, Like, I think this game, I just just think it's good. Uh, It is... I mean, it is good. It's a 3D Zelda, and all of them are good. Yeah. Just some of them are more good. Well, it's like it's like we talked about with Super Mario Sunshine. The, the bar is high, in general, oh, for yeah, that oh, this, franchise. I, I don't think that's a fair comparison. This is nowhere near as bad as Super Mario Sunshine. You're right. That's Twilight Princess. Um, but, 
I can't say that. I haven't played that game in years. Uh, I I don't know. I really, really like Wind Waker. Just, I think the, the, the fact that it is the only game that I think is more aesthetically strong than Wind Waker is Majora. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that those two sort of tower above everything. Twilight Princess, I think, sort of gets muddled by its art style, but like I said, it has, like, the best dungeon design in basically any of the games. I don't even think Twilight Princess's art, like, art design is bad. It's it's just... It influenced Smash Brothers a little too much. Yeah, boy, did it. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of glad that Toon Link is in Smash... But I do wish that they gave him more abilities that were just Wind Waker-ish. Yeah. Uh, instead of him just being Short Link again. And he was clearly supposed to be the same fighter as Young Link. Yeah, pretty much. I don't know. I, like, I don't totally understand why they didn't go back on that. But he's, nah, who knows? he was very clearly meant to fill the same role. He should be an Echo fighter. <laughs> He's he's up there with Dr. Mario where it's like why aren't you just an echo fighter man? Come they on. were weirdly unwilling to make any character from before Smash Wii U an echo fighter. Yeah, and they really shouldn't have been. But yeah. I I'm I'm very excited to replay this game. Uh, I haven't played it in a couple of years and I really like Wind Waker a lot. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. And you know who else is replaying it right now? And by right now, I mean in like two months. <laughs> <laughs> the the NWR's Connectivity Podcast is currently in the 3D Zelda Game Club. You know, I'm and seeing a contradiction between the two things you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they are going to be playing Wind Waker roughly around the time that we are. Right now, they're on Majora's Mask. And... Wind Waker's not going to start till like the beginning of May, but we might be done by then. But the point is that if you want to come over to the NWR Discord, talk about some Zelda games, and listen to a cool podcast with those guys, Neil and John, that we talk about, you should check out NWR Connectivity. They'll be playing it around the same time as we will. He says about the game, we'll be done with like before in mid April. Oh, it says followed, you. Followed by. You saw how long Metroid Prime took. That's because I wasn't able to start for three weeks. Uh, but yeah, looking forward to it. And we will probably both be on that connectivity, I think is the plan currently, at yeah, least. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm on all of. I'm going to be on all the 3D Zelda Game Club episodes except for Twilight Princess because of this show. <laughs> I mean, we're still a good at least year and a half out from Twilight Princess. That's too soon, I think. Yeah, that's fair. Although it's been even longer since you've replayed Twilight Princess, so maybe that works. Maybe that's fine. I mean, I haven't replayed Twilight Princess since, like, 2013. (laughs) It's been it's been almost 10 years since I played Twilight Princess. Uh, we'll figure it out. That's that's we'll later. Figure it out. Yeah, that's future. That's future Matt and Joe's problems. And fuck those guys, honestly. Anyways, hey, thanks for listening. You can follow us on Twitter and on YouTube at Smash Your Pieces. We have a Facebook too, but don't follow that. Delete your Facebook, and also I don't update it because I don't care. Do we uh, have a TikTok? We do not have a TikTok, but NWR has a TikTok. NWR does have a TikTok. How do we get John to put Smash Your Pieces on the NWR TikTok? He literally did. One of your Majora's Mask clips is on there. Well, yeah, no, he did put a, a stream clip, uh, and then somebody was like, "Oh, beating the dead horse of, of Majora's Mask." It's like, what are you fucking? Okay, whatever, dude. <laughs> um. You can follow me on Twitter at Street Pixel. You can follow Matt at Grivis, Do Menace. And you can follow our editor, Peter, at Pete Speakeasy. Uh, by the way, if you go to anondino.squarespace.com, you can find not only Smash Your Pieces, but you can find the other show I do. I do with Peter. It's called Original Sound Chat. We talk about game music, and it's pretty good. It is pretty good. I've listened to it a couple times. Once. More <laughs> than least, once. At least once. Uh, 
minimum. And that's basically it. I don't got anything else. So, until then, my name is Joe. And my name is Matt. And we'll see you next time for our episode discussing The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker.